Welcome back to Med School Radio. We are now going to talk about thrombosis and hemostasis, hemostasis and thrombosis. I found this magazine cover and I think it's very appropriate. So what we're going to do is we're going to discuss a case and we're going to talk about everything concerning thrombosis and hemostasis. So let's start. First case presentation. A 24-year-old woman in her 25th week of pregnancy is concerned because she has felt no fetal movement for three days. Three weeks later, uh, she had not given birth and suddenly developed dyspnea and cyanosis. Her vital signs were as follows. Temperature 36.9 degrees centigrade. Pulse 102. Respiration is 21. Blood pressure 80 over 40. She has ecchymoses all over her body and is oozing from a venipuncture site. A stool sample is positive for occult blood. There are fragmented cells on the peripheral smear. Other laboratory studies reveal an elevated PT and a PTT. The platelet count is decreased. The plasma fibrinogen is markedly decreased and there are, are abundant fibrin split products. Three blood cultures are negative. What is the most likely case, most likely cause of this? Catastrophic bleeding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip down to the end and we're going to just look at to see what uh, is said about this case while you were thinking about it. The presence of widespread ecchymoses, thrombocytopenia, increased PT and APTT, decreased fibrinogen and increased fibrin split products are all consistent with DIC. In this instance, the most likely cause is a retained dead fetus, a grave obstetric complication that can cause DIC because of release of thromboplastins from the fetus. This tissue factor-like material ignites coagulation, causing consumption of clotting proteins and platelets and development of microvascular thromboses in arterioles and capillaries. The platelet count falls because of development of widespread thromboses, which are platelet-rich. Okay, so now let's go back and we're going to talk in some detail about hemostasis and thrombosis. Introduction. Blood in the vessels of the circulatory tree is pumped at high pressure, making it essential that there be protective mechanisms to defend against life-threatening hemorrhage if a vessel wall is breached. Equally important is preventing the development of untimely or inappropriate clot formation or thrombi that could block the flow to organs and lead to death. Indeed, in the Western world, thrombotic events lie at the core of cardiovascular disease, with myocardial infarctions and stroke, the first and third leading causes of death, respectively. These two cardiovascular categories are more common than bleeding disorders, of which motor vehicle accidents are the most common proximate cause. Motor vehicle accidents all too often cause massive bleeding that cannot be contained by the coagulation system. Thus, there must be carefully controlled processes that maintain the liquidity of the blood and the integrity of the vascular system. The major elements of this hemostatic system are the vascular endothelium, platelets, and the plasma proteins responsible for carrying out blood coagulation and fibrinolysis. These three systems work together to maintain the integrity of these circulatory vessels. In arterioles, and to some extent arteries, vasoconstriction is the immediate response to a tear in a vessel wall. But if the defect is large, decreasing blood flow is only a temporizing measure. A more permanent repair must be made if hemorrhage is to be contained. To be sure, manual pressure and surgical repair will be required for large wounds. Many types of vessel injuries can be controlled by the two arms of the hemostatic system. Formation of a temporary platelet plug at the site of damage to the subendothelium and stabilization of the initial plug 
by genesis of a fibrin-based clot. The fibrin clot is formed by the series of sequential enzyme-mediated steps, the so-called plasma coagulation system. Vasoconstriction and formation of the platelet plug are referred to as a primary hemostasis, and formation of the fibrin clot is called secondary hemostasis. Now let's discuss the vascular endothelium. Under normal conditions, the intact monolayer of endothelial cells that constitute the vascular endothelium maintains the fluidity of the blood by shunning interaction with platelets and preventing platelets from aggregating. Under normal conditions, the intact monolayer of endothelial cells that constitute the vascular endothelium maintains the fluidity of the blood by shunning interaction with platelets and preventing platelets from aggregating. Endothelial cells have surface glycoproteins and glycosaminoglycans, which, are, which is heparin sulfate and heparin, that repel the negatively charged platelets with their marked, uh, ne marked uh, negative charge. Sorry, above the uh, glycosaminoglycans are heparin sulfate and heparin. Should a vessel be breached, the subendothelial basement membrane contains several endothelial cell-derived adhesive proteins, which are collagen, thrombospondin, and von Willebrand's factor, which provide a site for platelets to bind and plug a tear. Endothelial cells secrete renin, which activates angiotensin production, a potent vasoconstrictor. Endothelial cells can also secrete nitric oxide, a potent vasodilator. The glycosaminoglycans, hepar heparin and dermatin sulfate, accelerate the anticoagulation, anticoagulant activity of antithrombin-3, a potent inhibitor of coagulation. The initial step in the coagulation sequence is triggered by the expression of tissue factor on the surface of a damaged or perturbed endothelial cell. Exposure of this potent procoagulant commences the so-called extrinsic pathway of coagulation. Endothelial cells also synthesize a modulator of tissue factor called tissue factor pathway inhibitor or TFPI which shuts down the extrinsic pathway. It is this inhibition of the extrinsic path by TFPI that makes participation of the intrinsic pathway essential to the formation of fibrin to, sec to secure the clot. If the extrinsic pathway were not under such powerful inhibition, coagulation could proceed without the intercession of the intrinsic pathway. Now let's talk a little bit about platelets. Platelets are anucleate disc-shaped cells, 2 to 4 micrometers in diameter, which are normally found in the blood at concentrations of 150,000 to 400,000 micro per microliter. Platelets are formed from megakaryocytes, each of which produces 1,000 to 3,000 platelets. Platelets circulate in the peripheral blood for 9 to 10 days. These metabolically complicated cells play two vital roles in hemostasis as follows. 1. Platelets adhere to and aggregate at sites of vessel wall injury, thus repairing the injury, a function that is greatly enhanced by the incorporation of platelets into the fibrin clot. And 2. Platelets provide a phospholipid surface that dramatically accelerates the reactions of blood coagulation, enhancing both thrombin generation and fibrin formation. Platelet structure and formation. Platelets are approximately one half the diameter of red cells, but possess a much more complex structure and function. Platelets contain an extensive canalicular system that connects the various organelles and the platelet membrane and a cytoskeleton which is responsible for the disc shape and changes in shape when the platelet is activated. Platelets contain mitochondria because 
platelets are metabolically active, but like erythrocytes, platelets lack a nucleus, indicating that DNA replication and RNA synthesis do not occur. So remember that, the, that platelets do contain mitochondria. Because of the high pressure of the circulatory system, it is not unusual for small gaps to occur in capillary and venule endothelium. It is the job of platelets to seal these gaps. Evidence for this role is the occurrence of petechiae when platelet counts fall below uh, 50,000 per microliter. At rest, i.e. an unstimulated state, platelets circulate in the blood as discs, a shape maintained by microtubules deployed directly below the cell membrane. When platelets are activated by binding an agonist such as thrombin, uh, such as thrombin, collagen, or ADP at the site of exposed subendothelium, actin in the cytoskeleton polymerizes. This polymerization induces the shape change, which is attended by extension of phyllopodia. This is followed uh, promptly by secretion of platelet granule contents into the plasma and aggregation of numerous platelets at the site of vessel wall injury. Adhesion to denuded endothelium is brought about through bridges made by collagen fibers, von Willebrand's factor and fibronectin. Von Willebrand's factor, a large molecular weight multi-timer, uh, multi binds to platelets through a specialized receptor uh, called the GPLB uh, factor 9 complex, whereas um, other adhesive proteins bind to platelet membrane GP2B slash 3A. So GP here stands for glycoprotein, although I may be mispronouncing the rest of the, of the word. Once platelets adhere to the subendothelium, this triggers the shape change noted above, where the extended pseudopodia um, facilitating the ability of platelets to interact with other platelets and with the subendothelial surface through adhesive proteins expressed there. This brings about aggregation of the platelets. Platelet secretory granules fuse with membranes of the canalicular system and discharge their contents, which include fibrinogen, vitronectin, ADP, ATP, serotonin, and calcium. All of these are pro-thrombotic in, in setting the vessel damage. Von Willebrand's factor is a large glycoprotein produced by endothelial cells and megakaryocytes. So again, von Willebrand factor is a large glycoprotein produced by endothelial cells and megakaryocytes. Von Willebrand's factor is synthesized as a monomer, but the predominant form is a disulfide-linked multimer uh, assembled in the Golgi. In this multimeric form, von Willebrand's factor is able to cross-link platelets and lash platelets to the sub endothelium. These linkages create a temporary anchor for the developing platelet plug at the site of vessel injury, while fibrin formation by the coagulation system, second, which is secondary hemostasis, consolidates and fortifies the plug. An inherited defect in GP1B-9 occurs in rare platelet disorder and uh, this will be discussed later, but this is called bernard Soulier's disease. Whereas GP2B slash 3A is, is deficient in Glanzmann's thrombasthenia. Both are associated with bleeding, petechiae, ecchymoses, and epistaxis. Several different defects in von Willebrand's factor function cause a group of bleeding disorders that are collect that collectively are the most common disorders of bleeding. 
so just to review here so in Bernard Soulier disease we have a defect on GP1B slash 9 and for Glanzmann's thrombasthenia we have GP2B slash 3A so there you have it in the next video we will discuss the coagulation system and secondary hemostasis.